Good morning. Good to see everybody. Hope you're having a wonderful week in the Lord. So uh, I think that's all. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer and ask his, his blessing to be with us today. Father, we do come to you with hearts of joy and rejoicing this morning as we lift up your holy and wonderful name. Lord, we gather in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Lord, we do not gather because we are worthy because we've done anything to deserve your favor or your presence. But we come before you, Lord, based upon the shed blood of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We come, Lord, based upon his righteousness, faith that believes that he is the Savior, the Son of God. And so, Lord, we pray that you would meet with us. Lord, you know the needs of each heart, the encouragement, the strength, the guidance, the spiritual needs, the understanding of the word that we each need. Minister to us, Lord, as we open our hearts before you this morning. Receive our praise and our worship in Jesus' name. Amen. Rediscover Christmas. Rediscovering joy in Christ during Christmas, I mean, during discouraging times. The third Sunday of Advent signifies joy. It reminds us of the good news the angels told to the shepherds. 
Take time this week to light the third candle in your Advent wreath as well. Imagine yourself on a hillside where a joyous announcement is being made by a sky full of angels. Joy is possible even in the midst of hardship and discouragement. As you look for joy in Christ Jesus our Savior during this season, surrender the pain and fear in your life and ask God to fill you with the gift of His joy. Scripture reading, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has the light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel to the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and the peace there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and evermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Zechariah 9, verses 9 through 10. The coming King of Zion. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud. O daughter of Jew Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of the donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, and the war horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. The visit of the wise men. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And the assembling, all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them, Where is the Christ to be born? They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child marry his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. The shepherds and the angels. 
And in the same region were the shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over the flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. And for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was an angel, a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all heard it and wondered at what the shepherds had told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard as it had been told them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Lord of all creation, Mary, did you know? 
as we come to our time of, of uh, prayer together, congregational prayer, you'll see your throne of grace that's in your uh, handout. This week we're wanting to pray for uh, the spiritual and mental uh, health of our community and of course one another. Um, I've mentioned from the very beginning that one of the things that's concerned to me is that we're treating people as if they're only bodies uh, through all of this. And I've been in the ministry long enough to know that uh, we're a whole person. And so all this isolation and separation and anxiety is not good for people. So, um, you know, so this article kind of demonstrates from a secular standpoint, these are not, this is the Gallup poll, it's not a Christian publication, but demonstrating how the, the issues of mental health are dropping to an all-time low uh, in this past year. So it, it is definitely a time we need to be in prayer for each other. We need to pray uh, for God to give us seasons and opportunities to um, find fellowship and companionship with others. Um, you'll notice in this article, which I was amazed they were willing to admit it, that uh, some of the people who, who were affected the least were those who attended services of worship. So uh, I was encouraged to see that they actually told the truth about that. And, uh, you know, so of course you and I know that as Christians, the Lord is the source of our strength. And, uh, and in many ways, He uses the fellowship of the saints to do this, to build each other up. And so I always say, you know, I need you and you need me and we need each other. God's designed us that way. And so I'm not denying, you know, the, the, the COVID and danger and all that stuff. All I'm saying is our solution needs to include the spiritual life and, uh, and realize that, that people are more than just bodies. And so let's pray together and ask that God would give us opportunities. We that know the Lord are more attuned to these needs. So you might have a friend or a relative, a co-worker, uh, someone, a neighbor that you've, you've, God's laid on your heart. Maybe they're in trouble. Maybe something's happening and they need a word of encouragement. They need a car. They need some prayer. They need opportunity. We need to be uh, on task doing the Lord's work and also for each other, you know, to encourage, to keep, keep each other on the right path and trusting the Lord during these, these difficult times. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to, for congregational prayer. Uh, we know that many um, would make like the gathering or the assembling of the saints is a minor thing. And yet, Lord Jesus, you told us where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And so, Lord, we can, it doesn't take long as we read the scriptures to know that uh, there is something special about the gathering of the church of Jesus Christ. Lord, we know that you are everywhere, and yet you promised us that you would be uniquely manifested in the presence of your gathered congregation. So, Lord, we praise you for this opportunity to unite our prayers for the good of our congregation, for one another, for the work of the kingdom, for our community and our nation. We pray, Father, that uh, we as your people would be led by your Holy Spirit, that we would be ready with the word of God, ready with the gospel, uh, the truth of God in these dark times to share the light of Christ with those who are in darkness. Lord, we know that uh, many times, times of trials, and affliction are times that open people up and uh, stop them from uh, carrying on their lives as if eternity did not exist, as if you were not upon the throne, or that judgment is not coming. So Lord, we pray that you would help us to be cognizant and ready, as Peter said, to share the faith that we have in Jesus Christ at a moment's notice. We pray that you'd give us a tenderness uh, and a compassion 
for those about us that we might minister to them and lift their spirit and show them that our source of strength is not um, willpower, it's not stoicism, it's not positive thinking, uh, or pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps. But Lord, it is the Lord God, the Lord of heaven and earth, the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We rest our hearts and minds in the Word of God. We trust in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. So Father, we thank You for this. We pray that we would have it and use it for Your glory. In Jesus' name, Amen. If you will turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. I want to speak to you briefly this morning on the first promise of Christmas. We're continuing our series uh, on the coming King. The coming King. And we've spent two weeks looking at um, the prophecies and promises of the coming King. And uh, so now we're, gonna, we're going to take a few moments this morning to begin to consider the first promise of Christmas, the first promise of the coming of a Savior. And we see that in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, verse, verse 13. So we get a little bit of that context. The, the Lord God said to, to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all, stock, all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. And he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel." You know, in the previous studies, we've been seeing, or we've seen the idea of a coming deliverer. And we see that it runs deep within the Jewish belief, and that belief arises from the prophecies and promises of scriptures. At first, it was a vague promise, then a definite prophecy, and finally, a hopeful anticipation. The coming Savior was to be a deliverer, a prophet like Moses, a priest like Melchizedek in Hebrews 7, a healer and a miracle worker like the prophet Elijah, and a king like David. The Savior is the Messiah, the anointed one, the chosen one. In the Greek language, the word Messiah is translated the word, by the word Christ. This is why our Lord is called Jesus Christ. Uh, he, that's, of course, not his last name, but is his title. He is Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah. He is the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ. So now that we've done our survey of prophecies and promises, and, uh, you know, we, went, we want to take a few moments this morning to give special consideration to the first of the, the Proto-Evangelium. Where did this idea of Messiah originate? Why did the people of God begin to look for a deliverer? The answer to these two questions are found in Genesis chapter 3. I venture to say that if you do not have an adequate grasp of Genesis chapter 3, you're probably having a hard time understanding the entire Bible. Because Genesis chapter 3 is the reason for the rest of the Bible. And so this, it, is, it is only normal and natural that in this passage we would find not only the fall of man, which is the cause of the plan of God, but we would also see the promise of God for deliverance in the coming ages. And so we see in Romans chapter 5, that the Apostle Paul teaches that Adam was the representative of mankind. God made a perfect man in the garden, in the perfect environment, and yet man gave in to the temptation of Satan. Here we see man tested, and it is here that we see man fail. 
In the garden, mankind was given the opportunity to love and obey God above all else. But instead, he yielded to personal ambition. Therefore, we may say with the old Puritans, in Adam's fall, we sin all. There was in the garden a cosmic dilemma. Not that God had a problem, but that man had an eternal problem with being accepted with God. No, God had a plan. Man had a problem. The problem is stated by God himself in verses 13 through 15, as we read earlier. And we see that down in verse 22, a continuation of this plan where he says, The Lord God, the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us and knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, God says he will cast them out of the garden. So even the judgment of being forced from the garden was an act of mercy from God. Because God did not want man who had now fallen into sin and separation with God to then to partake of the tree of life and be forever fixed, we might say, or confirmed in iniquity and therefore have no hope of redemption. And so God uh, makes them leave the garden and access, therefore access, to the tree of life. In fact, He even posts an angel and a flaming sword to stop them from trying to... Uh, get back into the garden and that was done so that man might have this opportunity of redemption through God. That as we think about this promise and just so we're clear what is the promise we'll look in verse 15 so we'll know for sure what we're actually discussing. We see he says here, here's where God gives it I will put enmity between you the you there is the serpent or Satan. And the woman, Adam and Eve, are going to immediately believe the woman is Eve. But of course, we'll find out later that it's not. And between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head, serpent, and you shall bruise his heel. And so we'll... Consider this promise in more detail today. The first thing I want us to think about is that this promise, what is the content of this promise? What is God saying here in this passage? Well, the first thing He's saying here in this garden scene, which I believe is a historical event, I believe it thoroughly and completely. I do not believe it's metaphorical. I believe Adam and Eve were a man and a woman, a his, two historical figures who were tested by God and failed. I believe they were representatives of all mankind and therefore all mankind stands condemned before God. But God sent another Adam, the, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as Paul says in Romans, by one man's sin, death came upon all men. So by... Christ's righteousness, many will be saved. And so we see Christ is the second Adam. The first Adam failed. The second Adam succeeded. And we know the second Adam was indeed the Son of God. So the first thing we see in this promise is that there will be a deliverer. A deliverer. This passage spoken by God assumes the promise of a coming deliverer. God promised that if a deliverer would be born who would be victorious over the serpent. And when, he consider, when we consider this passage as a whole, one thing becomes very clear, that God is promising a deliverer here and, and uh, as a judgment on the serpent, but it was also a promise of mercy for mankind. There are other not as obvious implications inherent in this passage that we look at uh, we'll look at later. But at this point, I want us to see that the narrative is promising a deliverer. And that the deliverer's coming is two things. One, it's a judgment on the serpent or Satan. In other pa passages in the Bible, Satan is called the dragon. Here he is the serpent. 
But it's, these are uh, titles and names. You say, well, was it a real snake? I, I really don't know. I, I, I kind of think it was. But of course, we know that it wasn't a snake uh, that was just a normal animal. This was a snake. Uh, if it was a literal snake, a serpent, it was inhabited by Satan himself. It was not just a normal serpent in that sense. Uh, there is the possibility that God could be referring to, serp to the serpent here uh, as a title for Satan. Satan approaches Eve and God calls him a serpent. Uh, but I don't believe that's the case. The Some have argued for that. I don't believe it's the case because God curses the actual snake. He says you will, you will slither on the ground with the dirt in your face. So to me that's, that's saying that this was a literal snake that was inhabited by Satan himself. And we do know that that's possible. We see in the New Testament where uh, the demon-possessed man of Gadara, the demons inside of him said, do not cast us out without a body, essentially. Uh, cast us into these swine. And so Jesus said, okay. He cast the demons out. They went into the pigs. And the Bible says the pigs ran violently over a cliff and killed themselves there. So we do know that this kind of thing is possible. But, you know, that's not really the substance of our, of our study this morning. I know, it, but I know it's a question that would naturally come into your mind, so I didn't want to just leave that. But Adam and Eve understood the promise of God. This can be deduced by some of the actions recorded in the narrative. For instance, when Adam and Eve uh, had their firstborn, Cain, uh, in verse cha chapter 4, verse 1, Eve makes an ominous statement. She says, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And it is very clear that what she was saying, not that I had a baby, what she was saying is, God promised a deliverer, and I've just had a son. She believed Cain was the answer. To that promise. She believed that the plan of God to deal with sin was going to happen quickly. Which wouldn't you? I think that would be the natural thing. Adam and Eve sinned. They're out of fellowship with God. God set, gives a promise of a deliverer. And so naturally, when she has a child, she immediately thinks, here's the child. God has sent us the deliverer. But instead, what we get is a demonstration of the sinfulness, the fall of man, where Cain becomes a murderer of his own brother. And Abel then becomes a type of the death of Christ. So we see this, this unfolding uh, plan of redemption was going to take longer than just the beginning in the garden and in that uh, the following uh, years, but in fact was going to go into centuries, millennia, God was going to be unfolding this promise of redemption into what we now know is the New Testament. Another indication that Adam and Eve understood the promise and acted on it was their practice of a simple sacrificial system. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, did you ever notice this? Number one, it doesn't tell you that, that any sacrificial system is instituted. But when Cain and Abel have their falling out, what are they doing? They're worshiping. They're sacrificing. Cain brings, because Cain's a farmer, Cain brings of the fruit of the ground. Abel, a sheep herder, brings of the, the uh, flock. And now if we're not careful, we might miss the meaning of God telling us what they did for a living. We might easily think, oh, well, Cain just took, brought what he had, and God rejected it, and Abel just brought what he had. That's not the point of the passage. The point of the passage Cain is that brought the works of his own hands. Now, Abel, yes, was a sheep herder, 
But Abel was clearly obeying the commandments of God. Somewhere, God had given them a simple sacrificial system. Now, my guess is God showed it to Adam and Eve when he sacrificed animals and clothed them. That's my, I believe that's when God, he clothed them and he used the whole death of animals to show them that the price of sin is blood. It's a sacred death. Sin brings on death. And so God used that to teach them that worship of him now must involve a blood sacrifice. There must be a substitutionary death to pay for the sins that were committed. Well, and I believe so therefore, and I believe the passage is clear, that Cain and Abel both understood that. And I can tell you why I believe that. Because God tells Cain, when Cain is upset and angry about being rejected, God says a comment to Cain that's ominous. He says, if you do well, will you not also be accepted? Now what does that mean? God is not saying, if you're a good boy, I'll like you too. That's not what God is saying. God is saying... If you obey my commandments, will I not accept you as well? Abel followed clearly a commandment. Cain brought the works of his own hands. And God said, if you do the right thing, will I not accept you as well? But Cain refused. Why? Because Cain was rebellious. Cain was a murderer. Cain wanted to follow his own way. But my point here is that Adam and Eve knew. They understood what God was saying to them here. She was expecting a deliverer to come, and she thought it was her son. But, we found... but God does tell us about a child being born. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. A.W. Pink observed concerning this, he says, Here again we behold the exceeding riches of God's grace. Before he acted in judgment, he displayed his mercy. Before he banished the guilty ones from Eden, he gave them a blessed hope and promise. The deliverer was born. And when was he born? Well, Luke chapter 2, according to our Advent reading, chapter 2, verses 10 through 12, And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is called Christ, Messiah, Anointed One, Deliverer, Savior, Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will see a babe wrapped in a swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. You see, that is the fulfillment of that Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 promise. Now Eve thought that it was going to happen in her lifetime. Many throughout the centuries felt the same way. But we see Mary was the woman that was mentioned in that passage. Which brings us to the second thing. And that the deliverer would be miraculously born. Miraculously born. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. Well, the lady doesn't have the offspring, the man does. And so this was a clear point in the prophecy. This was a clear point in the promise that God was saying to Satan that the Messiah, the Deliverer that was going to come was uniquely, we might even say miraculously, coming not through a man, but through a woman. Now we know that was the Virgin Mary. Isaiah 7.14 confirmed it thousands of years later. Therefore the Lord Himself will give you a sign. 
Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and he shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. Messiah, Christ, Savior. This is the the promise. This was the fulfillment in Matthew chapter 1. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a man, a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her from the Holy, is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken to the prophet Isaiah. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. There it is. Miraculously born of the woman. God told Satan that the seed, his seed, would be at war with the seed or the offspring of the woman. By that statement, God was saying that the Deliverer, the Messiah, would be miraculously born. And of course, we know that was the virgin birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And then lastly, we see that this promise was a promise that the Deliverer would be wounded. You say, how is that in there? Well, follow along with me. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So this bruising is a result of the battle between God and Satan through God's Messiah. And it says here that the Messiah would be wounded. His heel would be bruised but the serpent would suffer a crushing blow to the head and so we see that Isaiah 53 tells us of this wounding of the suffering servant of God who has believed our report he says and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed for he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. I'm sorry. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. But all we, like sheep, have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. There's that Messiah. How is the Deliverer going to deliver us from sin? How is the second Adam going to reverse what the first Adam threw man into? By his own blood. By his own death. He would be bruised. But it's a bruise to the heel which we would take as a non-finishing blow. Yes, Jesus died, but what happened? He rose again. The Son of God was not finished. He was not crushed. But of course, Satan's cause was lost. He suffered upon the cross a crushing blow to the head. John chapter 10, verse 11 says, I am the good shepherd... This is Jesus. And the good shepherd lays down his life 
for the sheep. That's Christmas. That's the blessing. That's the promise that God gave us in Genesis chapter 3. The promise, the first promise of Christmas. So I don't know that you always think of Christmas when you go to Gen- and you go to Genesis, maybe you go to Luke chapter 2. But maybe now you'll go back to Genesis and realize that the problem for man began there. And the solution of God's plan also began there.